So. I think I'm uh, allowed to open this. Um, session now and um, so I welcome all and um, we have our uh, third keynote speaker today I would like to introduce him so we have uh, Professor Emeritus um, Lex Bauter with us um, he um, is a professor of me uh, methodology and in integrity at the Department of Epidemiology and Data Science of the Amsterdam University Medical Centers and also at the Department of uh, philosophy at the Faculty of Humanities of the Freie University of Amsterdam. I mean, he's, he's, re he's known very well for his uh, research in research integrity and um, an activist in open science matters. Um, and uh, some of you might, of course, also be familiar with the conference he um, initiated. This is the World um, Research Integrity Conference and uh, Hong Kong principles might sound a bell. So um, I, it's my pleasure to hand over to him now, and he will speak to us on how, why research integrity matters and what is out there in terms of how can we improve it. So, over to you, and please think about questions. We have some time after, and I, I look forward to our discussion. Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, let me get this going. Yeah, that's the right one. Um, as it was alluded to already, my topic is research integrity. And I'll talk about research integrity, explain that it matters, and also how it can be improved, because there is room for improvement. What I do have on the menu are the following points. I will first dwell on a few of the core concepts of research integrity, um, then move on to list some of the current problems we are facing in academic, uh, academical research, and then talk about a little bit more about open methods and open data, two corners of open science, which are quite well known nowadays and can help us to improve research integrity. And that will be the core of my argumentation. And then I move on to some other methods to improve research integrity and in fact also research quality, because research integrity is about research quality and I'll end with a few slides uh, announcing the World Conference. You have kindly already announced, uh, dear Chair. Let me start by explaining what I mean with research integrity. To me and to many other people, um, research integrity is about behavior. It's about behavior of individual investigators and also of collectives of investigators. And that behavior only in the extent that it improves or it deteriorates truth finding, validity, and trust in research. And you have trust in research, societal trust in research, and you have trust between researchers. You need both. Because when researchers cannot trust each other, you cannot progress on the work that has been done by your processors. Um, and when society doesn't trust us, they will never accept implementation of what we found. So for policy and for implementation and innovation, trust is essential as well. Well, you can get trust, but you need to deserve trust by being trustworthy. And to me, transparency is the key thing. When we are transparent, we can be checked. We are accountable. Trust and verify. That, that is the idea. And open science practices are about transparency and are thus also about uh, accountability. Let me start with some research. Um, this is a survey we've done in my small country, the Netherlands, um, and we try to engage all active scientists in the country uh, by doing a survey. Um, and in that survey, it was self-reported, bear that in mind we had strong guarantees for identity protection and we also checked that people believe that because admitting that you did something wrong, uh, people won't do that uh, when uh, next day their boss will call and say we need to talk. Uh, so identity needs to be protected well. This is what we found in the survey. We had 
11 so-called questionable research practices in the survey. Questionable research practices um, are things which you can better not do. Um, and five of them uh, are listed on this slide, the five most prevalent. Uh, people answered a, five point, a seven point scale, sorry, ranging from never to always during the last three years. Um, and frequent we take to be the upper three values of that scale. Not submitting or resubmitting a valid negative publication was admitted by 8.5% of our population. Self-admitted, so it, it probably won't be an overestimation and likely it will be an underestimation. Um, and that is, of course, the root cause of the replication crisis, selective reporting. People admit to that almost 18%. Not telling your readers in your paper the important flaws and limitations of your study. 70% admit to that. Not being a good supervisor in their own eyes. Supervising can be anything. Can be postdocs, PhD students, uh, research assistants, uh, students. Self-admitted, I'm not a good supervisor. Often not a super good supervisor, 15%. Also, almost 50% for insufficient uh, attention to your expertise, skills, and uh, equipment. And the same for note-taking and uh, admitting to do that inadequately. And when you take it together, remember we had 11 of these questionable research practices. When you take them together, more than half of our respondents admitted to at least one questionable research practices to do that frequently during the last three years. And it gets worse. We also asked, there was not a seven point scale, but a two point scale, e either you did it or you did it not during the last three years, fabricate data. We all know that's not a good idea. 4.3% admit to that. Tweaking data, falsifying data, again 4.2%. That is a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, when you are in a research department and you have 25 colleagues, on average, one of them is a data fabricator, a self-admitted data fabricator. Well, of course, not in your department. There will be two in the neighboring department. I know that. <laughs> but still, it's, it's, there is room for improvement. Let's, let's put it in, in that humble way. Um, and it's important that we take action to improve. Second problem. Fake publications. You all heard about paper mills. It's, it's a big thing nowadays uh, that papers are fabricated, either by individual researchers or by organizations which we label as paper mills. Um, they make them from scratch. Uh, humans can do that, software can do that. Uh, Chat GPT is a great tool for paper mills. They love it uh, and they use it abundantly already. We've seen that. Um, you can also plagiarize other papers, translate them, put pieces together, uh, write new papers by old ones, and there is good software for doing that. And also, that software can help you to prevent being detected by an, uh, a plagiarism detector software. It, it, it works well, awfully well. Um, these companies, these fake, uh, these paper mills, they sell authorships. You can find websites where you can buy a first, a second, or a last authorship on a paper um, on a no Q, no pay basis in a certain impact factor range. And why is that? Because people need that for their career. So the temptations are out there. The perverse incentives are out there. I'll talk to that about that later on. Fake reviewers. These paper mills have clever tricks to review their own manuscripts. Uh, they make a new email address for a well-known authority and they handle that email address and they review their own stuff. Big publishers have a lot of work now to detect these things. It's, it's awful. You have also fake editors, especially when they have uh, supplements uh, dealing with fake conferences. They exist as well, fake conferences. It's a mess. And we have completely fake journals, websites of... Uh, reputable uh, journals are, are copied, uh, mimicked, and then they are going into a paper mill factory as well. So it's quite awful what's happening. We need to fight that, and that's important. 
Third and last problem I'd like to allude to, and that is the problem of the replication crisis. It's now in the air about a little bit more than 10 years. Nature 2012, animal research in oncology, uh, a little bit more than 10% was reproducible. That means that when you redo a study in this exact same way, you get only in 10% of the cases the same finding. That was shocking. That was shocking. Later on, we did some uh, surveys, we did some studies with uh, royal societies in the Netherlands and the Academy of Sciences in the USA, did some learned reports on them. They're, they're completely boring, boring, but you can read them because all the details are in there. Uh, by the way, all my slides will be available through the website of this conference later on. And below the slides, uh, I have many references to, to report, to YouTube, to TED Talks, to articles, whatever. So you can dig deeper if you want. I don't like references in slides, but they are below the slides and they're available to all of you. Recently, a few weeks ago, um, a systematic review appeared, well done. Many studies, 177 uh, replication collections summarized together, and it appeared across the board, all the disciplinary fields were included, across the board, only half of them, 54%, were replicable. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. And as I said before, selective reporting is probably the root cause of that. Let me summarize what I said so far. Um, on the left side of the slide, you see in, in, in reddish color the, 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 the problem, the fabrication, the falsification, the plagiarism, the questionable research practices, and the replication crisis. They all together and individual lower validity and trustworthiness of research. I also already alluded to the fact that transparency is wonderful. Transparency is boosting validity and trustworthiness because it makes you accountable as a researcher. You can check and verify. You can do the replication studies if you want. And open science, that's my next thing, helps a lot to improve transparency and two specific elements of open science, namely open methods and open data, they help a lot to improve the research practices. We call them responsible research practices and they can help to detect problem, uh, problems in the three panels on the left side of the slide and also to improve the situations in terms of prevention. And that is a main message of, of my talk. Um, I know, of course, that open science is a lot more. Uh, this is a slide by Brian Nosek. He used it a few months ago uh, at the 10-year anniversary party of the Center of Open Science. It's an expanding universe. Open science is about everything. It's, it's, it's a, containing, a container concept and, and it runs the risk to mean nothing anymore because it is so much. All the important um, equity, diversity and inclusion issues, the EDI issues, are sleep, sneaking in there as well. Well, you can do that, but you cannot lump all the problems together. I try to focus now for this talk um, on the open methods and the open data. Uh, and I'm not saying that the rest is unimportant, but only that I will not talk about it today. Open methods, most of you will know that that's about registration or, or pre-registration. Um, that means that you first write what you're going to do in your study, you park it somewhere in the cyberspace with a timestamp on it, uh, to document that that is your plan before you embarked on data collection. And then later on, everyone can check that you did what you planned. It's not a prison. You can change your plans along the way, but then you have an amendment. The amendment is also timestamped, and then everyone can see when you made the amendment and whether your, your, your analysis might be data-driven a little bit or not. So, Check and verify it, that enables it, and it enables also replication. Because when the recipe of a study is not av available, you cannot redo it. That's a big problem with many studies. You have no clue what they did. And, and when you read the method paragraph, that's usually not a good recipe of what, what happened exactly. It's not good enough to replicate a study. And there is another thing called registered report. 
um, and there is, that is in the middle, sometimes full um, protocols, including data analysis plans, are published. And I like that a lot, because really, you need that for a replication study. Otherwise, it's, it's hardly possible to do a replication study. And then there is this thing called registered reports. I allude to that on the next slide. The essential traits of registration, that's the term in biomedicine, and pre-registration, that's the term in, in social sciences, um, are that it is perspective. That, that's what I just alluded to. You do it before you start collecting your data. It's nice when it is public, because then everyone can check what you did. But that's not essential, because all these repositories allow you to have an embargo on the stuff for a few months, for a few years, whatever you like. You have to justify the embargo, but it, it, it can be there. And then the amendments, I alluded to that already, they can be uh, timestamped, uh, added to the registration. And this is the registered report. It's, it's so wonderful. I, I love it a lot. It's still in the early phase of adoptions. Uh, a little bit more than 300 journals are now using it. And the idea is brilliant. Two-stage peer review. Uh, when you have a grant, when you have permission, when you need it for, for medical or research ethics, and when you're about to start your data collection, then you stop and you first write your article. That is to say, the, the first paragraph of your article, the introduction and the method section. That you send to a journal. And then the journal has anything they need to judge your work. In the introduction, they can read what you're going to do and they can judge whether it's relevant. And in the methods, they can read how you're going to do it, and they can judge whether you will do it well. And on that basis, they decide to publish your paper or not. That's great, because the editors and the reviewers are not, not distracted by your findings, because there are no findings. It's a brilliant idea, and it's a killer of selective reporting. It's a killer of publication bias. And then, you, when it is accepted, with minor revision, major revision, the whole thing, uh, the usual thing, once it's accepted, you can start collecting your data. And then people do that, and after that, they write the rest of their article, send it in, and it's published. Uh, and the only thing they check is whether you did what you promised in the first two sections of your paper, and whether you wrote it down well. Now, recently, um, it has been proven that it really works. This is a great study. It's on the left side of the panel. Um, on, on the right column, you see registered reports, 71 of them, the first 71 of them ever published. Um, and 45% only supported the null hypothesis, uh, supported, the, sorry, supported uh, the first hypothesis, the, the active hypothesis. So the 45% were negative studies, so to say. And then they took um, a sample, a well-matched sample, double-matched sample of 152 regular studies, same topics, same journals, uh, same types of research, and so on and so forth. And of these studies, uh, more than 95% were positive. And that's usual. That has been investigated a lot in many journals, in many disciplines and subdisciplines. <coughs> People have 95% positive result, 90 to 95% positive result. So this shows that it is a killer of selective reporting. And there is a bonus. The bonus is on the lower right panel of this slide, you see all types of indicators for study quality and study methodology. And they're all superior for registered reports. Why is that? That is because the peer review is so helpful. I'm a methodologist. And when I was doing peer review in the past, I was always nagging about the methods of the study. That's so stupid. The study has been done already. It's not useful anymore. But now it's useful. You can make suggestions, methodological suggestions, and when they the, the people like it, the, the applicants like it, they can improve their study. And that is what you see on, on, the, on the right panel on, on the lower part of this slide. So it's, it's, it's a miracle. And my small prediction is that this, this will get flying 
specifically when the funders take it aboard. And now some funders are taking it aboard. They, they're saying, well, listen, you can get your grant to do this study. But there is one condition. You do a registered report first. You get six months to do the registered report, and you get a small amount of your budget to do the registered report, and only when that is done, you get the rest of the subsidy. That's so clever. That's so clever. This is the future. Well, I'm, I'm poor at predicting the past already, but I shouldn't predict the future. Sorry. You know about uh, FAIR data. I, I, I won't dwell on that. It's really important, but I've seen that on this conference there are many sessions on FAIR data. Uh, libraries are doing great things with, with data repositories, so I'm not going to teach you about that. That's like well, preaching to the converted, and you are the converted already. So I, I skip that, but I wanted to say that FAIR data is really important as well. Let's dwell now a few moments on what is the reason that researchers are not behaving that well. And, and we can see, supported by the research, that there are individual factors. It's about the virtuousness of these researchers. There are institutional factors. Uh, the research climate in the research group, in the lab, so to say, and there are systemic factors. These are the factors which are the incentives and they can be perverse or wonderful incentives. We also looked in our national survey into that. We had uh, nine scales, well-validated scales, for putative drivers of problems in research integrity. Um, the arrows, green, then, then the association is in the right direction. Red, the association, is what we don't like to see. And there is only an arrow when it's important and significant. And, and all the statistics are in the papers, and you can read them because the references are below the slides. When people believe, when people believe that reviewers will detect fraud, like fabrication, they engage less in that. That's, that's an association. It's not causal because it's cross-sectional, it's all self-reported, but still. Uh, and by the way, reviewers cannot do that. That has been proven. Reviewers are really do, doing lousy jobs at detecting fraud. You need other methods for that. When people support the research integrity norms, the Mattonian norms, so it will be on the next slide, I believe, less questionable research practices, less fabrication, falsification, more responsible research practices. There are two types of survival, two good scales for that. Um, Supervision for survival means that people help you to survive in academia like it is. They learn you how to cut corners, how to get the next grant, how to polish your paper uh, by leaving out a lot of negative stuff to make it more beautiful, uh, and how to get your tenure in academia by cheating a little bit and by cutting corners. And Supervision for survival is associated with more questionable research practices because it's, it's about questionable research practices. Responsible supervision are supervisors who learn you how to do science as good as it can without being distracted by your career perspective, uh, by financial gains, by being famous, and so on and so forth. They learn you to pre-register to curate your data well, to upload them in repositories, um, and to do all the right things, and to be a good peer reviewer for journals, for instance. Normally, you don't get career points for that, but that's an important thing in academia. And then there is a scale, finally, for publication pressure and, and perceived publication pressure, and that's strongly associated with more questionable research practices and less responsible research practices. And that is probably because these responsible research practices, they take so much time. It's a lot of work to curate your data, for instance. It's a lot of work. And when you don't get career points for that, people don't do that. These are the Mattonian norms. You will probably know them. Um, uh, they're wonderful, 1942 published, and still all the codes of conduct for research integrity are based on these Mattonian norms. You can recognize it so easily in all the principles and all the norms. It's great. The, that, that guy understood it already, and I especially like the last one, the, the norm of organized scepticism. 
and, and that is close to what open science and especially open methods and open data is all about. Institutions have a huge responsibility to empower their researchers to do the right thing, to do responsible research. And that they do in many ways, and one of them is giving education on research integrity. It's nowadays quite normal to do it to PhD students, uh, and sometimes to bachelor and master students as well. It's not so normal yet, and that's unfortunately, to do it to more senior researchers. Uh, there are sometimes courses available, but they're never mandatory. Uh, the supporting staff and the people taking care of research integrity, hardly any courses are available for these people, and they have important roles in maintaining the quality of research and the quality uh, of, of science. And then, of course, it needs to be a one-day course in a career. You need to have attention to research integrity all the time. Now, we made guidelines, and the four guidelines are on this screen, in a wonderful European consortium labeled Standard Operating for Research Integrity. Please have a look at the website. There are more than 130 well-organized guidelines how to improve things for research institutes and how to improve things for funding agencies. It's, it's really a great project, and we wrote a beautiful Nature paper um, explaining why it is important to have a research integrity promotion plan, uh, to have coherence in all the activities within an academic environment. And like I alluded to already, um, research is a social activity. And it's basically running about the interaction between early career researchers and their supervisors, which are more senior investigators. And this cartoon tells it well. So much can go wrong in that relationship. That's, that's quite amazing. And what is more amazing to me even is that in most universities, when you are a professor, you can be a supervisor. There is no license to supervise. You don't need to go to a course. There is no intervision. There is no supervision. It's, sometimes there are some voluntary courses, but there are no obligations there. It's the most difficult thing I ever did in academia, being a supervisor of a PhD student. And I've had many of them, and I still find it very difficult. It's not easy. So that's why we decided that we needed a course for that. And, and in our university, in our campus, uh, one of my, my star PhD students, Tamar in the Haven, she said, well, this is going quite well, our project, but I hear horror stories from my friends. There are so many poor supervisors, can I teach them? And I said, yes, I line you up with someone who's a good teacher and a trainer. And they developed a course called Superb Supervision, and it's learning supervisor how to supervise in a way to promote responsible research practices in their students and postdocs. Uh, and it's a great success. They, they tilt, they're still teaching the course worldwide in all types of universities, and, and it's quite a hit uh, in, 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 in Dutch universities as well. Finally, uh, let's talk about the perverse incentives. The perverse incentives are important uh, to avoid because assessment of researchers is so prevalent. It's really very prevalent. You have to be careful with that. Uh, we do it for grant applications, vacancies, promotion, tenure, and awards. Um, there are attendant effects when we judge people on citations and publications. That is what you get. More citations, more publications. But there are downsides. You also get a focus on quantity, not quality. You get more plagiarism. You get more duplicate publication. You get smaller articles, the salam, salami slicing thing. You get gift authorship. You get predatory open access journals. You get paper mills. You get less responsible research practices like um, open data. So the downsides are awful of that. Uh, in this review, uh, published last week uh, as an open access book chapter, um, you can read uh, what 
the wonderful initiatives worldwide are to improve assessments of researchers. And you all heard about DORA uh, and, and the Leiden Manifesto mainly, but there is much more really good alternatives. Um, finally, I'd like to urge you, really to urge you, that we take care about collecting the evidence that interventions to improve research integrity work before we start implementing them. Let's not rush into action. Let's study whether they work. <coughs> there are many policies that should work because they sound so plausible, but when you check, they don't work in practice. So that is important to document it and to measure their efficacy well before implementation. Uh, and we can measure a lot. We can measure process outcomes like uh, participation, satisfaction. Uh, we can um, have intermediate outcomes like uh, improvement of attitude, knowledge, skills. It's all interesting. But the final thing is whether FFP goes down, responsible research practices go up, and whether research quality improves. And we need internationally to agree on the scales and on the outcome sets we need to measure because then we can do good systematic reviews showing what are the good policies to, to implement and what are policies which are not that good to implement. And that's so important. And when you do implementation, um, this is from Brian Nozick as well, uh, but he, he borrowed it from other people, of course. Uh, that's not easy implementation. Once you have a proven effect, effective um, implementation of an, 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 an intervention, you should first make it possible and then make it easy. These are the things that libraries um, in, in, in Europe nowadays are great at. They enable these things. They do a great job. But you need help from the communities to make it normative, to make it rewarding, and lastly, to make it required. And that is the way you implement a new thing. So you need to collaborate with the, the leadership of universities and also with the uh, academic community for the higher steps in this pyramid. I won't talk about these things. Um, I'm a great fan of open application, uh, open grant application as well, of open funding procedures in general, and open peer review is, is, is near to, dear to my heart. And I've published a few articles on lottery to, to give away grants. Uh, that might sound ridiculous, but it's a good idea. Uh, but I won't talk about that. Uh, my time is, is up. Uh, I'd like finally to say to you, if you like the topic, if you believe that the topic is important, please consider to come to Athens to the next World Conference on Research Integrity. It will be in June next year. Uh, it will be a hybrid conference, so you can do it online as well. And all the topics I've alluded to and much more will be on the program of this conference. There's a great conference website. Please check it out. There's a leaflet in your conference back as well on this. And if you want more of former conferences and the videos of plenary sessions of former conferences, you can go to the website of the Foundation of the World Conferences. And on the Vimeo channel, we have many great lectures uh, available for you. It's also nice teaching material to use. Um, and with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'll hand over to the chair again. Thank you very much, Shabar. This was a very um, interesting talk, and I um, thank you also for your comments on uh, the role of libraries. So we are at the bottom of the pyramid, but maybe there are comments in the room, questions. So anyone volunteering? So if not immediately, I mean, my question, of course, is, is there anything in terms of advice from you in next steps for the library community? I mean, in the sense, of course, we sometimes think about we have some impact, but it's um, hard to always, I mean, to find ways of how to demonstrate it and um, make the case for there's more needed. And um, as you say, the networks are important. I mean, the community has to take this up and the researchers have to do their thing. And of course, then the bottom up and top down meet in the middle. Yeah. Well, that's, it's a great question, but and I should be humble in answering it because I'm not a librarian. I'm a user of libraries, uh, but not a librarian. 
Um, what I see happening in my country and many other European countries is that libraries are centers of innovations on, on university campuses. It's really great what's happening there. They're working on systematic review, especially research searches. Uh, they, do, they did well in the past. They're developing open uh, science methods, specifically open data. They're giving good courses, um, e-learning, face-to-face uh, -face courses. They're doing great work, but communication. Make yourself known on the campus. I now on my campus in Amsterdam, wonderful stuff that's happening in the library and hardly anyone of the active scientists on the campus have heard about it. They have no clue what wonderful assets are available to them. So you seem to have a, a somewhat of an image problem, of a communication problem. And, and you can solve that by working together with local champions. Please try to identify a local champion on your campus or a few of them. Um, for, for instance, what, what we have in our country, and it happens in many more countries now, is this idea of data stewards. These are people in the faculties, in the, the, the large research departments, usually linked to the university libraries as well that run the repositories and run the teaching and everything. Um, and, and then you see that researchers take notice. Well, of course, the open data is greatly helped by funding agencies making it an obligation, of course, as well. But, but there you see that the role of the libraries is now recognized. But, but you're doing much more, in, in my experience, but it's not that well known on, on most campuses. Yeah. So there is an image problem, maybe, mm. slightly. Yeah, I mean, from the perspective of libraries, it's also, also you know, researchers have sometimes a hard time to leave their uh, silo. <laughs> When they, true, um, true. It takes even if they tango. might take note, um, so we, we try this also through other formats. I mean, you might also have these uh, informal meetups on open science topics, and then some researchers come up to others. Uh, you have a bit harder time because yeah. they, they feel, okay, we are the experts, and then, okay, but still we don't know, and um, I, I don't want to be exposed in, as someone who doesn't know. So. Well, that, that, that makes sense what you're saying, and, and um, I, I fully agree. But, but, but maybe a, a, a good thing to start is the early career researchers, because they're, they can hardly understand why we did things differently in the past. Um, and we have open science communities all over the place. We have reproducibilities. Uh, mm -hmm. We have reproducibility networks locally. Um, and when libraries start supporting the early career researchers, they can tell it mm. to their supervisors and they can make things happen in, in faculties. They're, they're, they're a great force in, of change, early career professionals. They have no vested interest. They can change more quickly. So maybe do yeah. it indirectly yes, yes. through the early career professionals. So, uh, can someone please, the microphone somewhere in the middle here? Hmm? Microphone. Can you use the microphone? Test it, someone. <coughs> so thank you for the very interesting talk that gave a lot of ideas. Uh, but um, you started um, uh, your talk with uh, an argument that we hear and use a lot in open science, namely that we need openness to be more transparent and more trustworthy. Uh, and it's also an argument that has been used during the COVID-19 pandemic. But at that moment, we also saw that non-validated papers were used in the press and um, uh, that uh, published papers that have been retracted afterwards were also used, as well as uh, papers that were still preprints. And that people also believe what they want to believe. So how do we tackle this? And is open science enough for this? And what will be, would be the role of libraries? Well, that's a great question. Um, and it's a great question for me as well. I, I don't have a real answer to that. Um, I only want to say that to me, there is no alternative to transparency. It's, it's rather a no brainer. Uh, it should be open there. And yes, there are undesirable side effects of, of being open. Uh, and that is when everything is preprinted and people get carried away by preprints which are still not valid, 
uh, it can go wrong and, and people are selective in, in reviewing literature uh, and that's the reason we invented systematic reviews and doing meta-analysis to, to push back that selectivity. But you still see narrative reviews focusing on specific corners the, the authors of the review specifically like. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what it is, but it's, it's based on trust and distrust as well. Uh, what, what we see happen during COVID in society uh, what was quite interesting and very, very puzzling. Um, we have no clue how to communicate well with society and with people in society in a way that, they, they, that we listen to them in a normal way and also that they're able to understand that science is not about pontificating certainty, it's about assessing the magnitude of doubt you had. That, that is a difficult message to, get, to convey to many people, but that is the essence of the whole thing. So I don't have a real solution, uh, but I don't think we should close up again because of this unsi undesirable side effect. So one more question in the middle. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you very much for your, your presentation. That was really interesting and full of ideas. Um, I have a, a question regarding how we can be a useful uh, inter I mean, a uh, person or service uh, as a libra library uh, for, I mean, in the case, for example, where we have, I mean, um, for example, I'm, I'm going to take the French context because that's my context. It's really hard uh, to uh, go for, I mean, deeper than just explaining to researchers or young researchers uh, research integrity when the sanction taken against uh, people who actually fabricate or falsificate are so small. Um, we had issues recently in France of people getting very small sanctions. And when institutions, are, we, I mean, we feel that sometimes we, ha we are identified by people we can be, I mean, that researchers can talk to to be trained uh, in research integrity and to help them uh, navigate these issues. But how can we actually have, I mean, how can we be more useful in when um, sanctions are not really Working. big, I mean, for people who actually are well, doing that, fraud? That's again an important point. Um, well, I'm, I'm not a great believer in, 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 in sanctions. Um, they need to be there, of course, but it doesn't work in criminology either. There is, there's a lot of good research on that. We, we have to be careful thinking that when you, the punishment and the likelihood of being caught, they do have some influence, but they're not the most important. What I believe is the most important, uh, and libraries cannot do a lot um, to that, I, I, I fear, that is um, what brings you career points, the assessment of researchers when you get career points for being a great reviewer, for being a great supervisor, for putting your data in a repository, bonus points when someone else is using your data, bonus points when someone else is replicating your study, uh, being a good teacher. When we reward responsible research practices, I believe that is what we convey the message is what we report reward is important and people will grasp that message and will start behaving that way people are shouting that they want to be recognized for doing the right thing no one enters research to become a fraud of course not people want to improve the world they they have ideas to enter in in research communities we should help them to do the right thing by making it easy and by rewarding the, 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 the right thing. And that is the thing libraries can do. It was on one of my light slides. Make it easy. And you can improve there as well, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm, I still have the memory of the early days of open access. And then you went to your library and you ask, OK, I want to publish this paper, open access. And then you get a difficult story about author versions and, and, and retention time before you could upload it. No one could understand these messages, only librarians. So make it stupidly simple, please. That, that is important, and that will make it go flying as well. 
Okay. So. Sometime watch goes. I think we are running out of time. Thank you again, and thank you to the audience for your questions. Thank <laughs> you.